I'm honoured to be providing the committee and all present today a brief insight into Australian grassroots and civil society response to the most ferocious military assault on Gaza and the Palestinian people since the 1948 Nakba. The response has been multifaceted and widespread, given the majority support from the Australian people for a permanent ceasefire. Visibly, it has been evident in the weekly weekend protest marches across the country since the assault began in what is now the largest anti-war movement in Australia since the war against Iraq. Very early on, civil society rallied to put out a statement calling for a permanent ceasefire, supported by over 100 organisations, especially as Parliament remained silent on the atrocities unfolding in Gaza and focused only on the unlawful attacks and violence committed on 7 October by Palestinian armed groups in Israel. While it was evident that Israel's attacks from the outset were manifestly in violation of international law and at minimum ought to have been condemned, the Australian government and the majority of the Australian parliament ignored Israel's attacks, even in the face of what was prima facie evidence and statements of genocidal intent and policies coming from Israeli authorities. The civil society response has at many times been difficult and marred by anti-Palestinian racism, where concerted actions by the right-wing press, some politicians and pro-Israel lobby groups derailed focus from Israel's genocidal attacks on Gaza and resorted to attacking Palestinians and their supporters who advocate for Palestinian human rights. Palestinian-led civil society groups have welcomed, advocated for and mobilised to help support and settle those arriving from Gaza, about 350 so far. Activists, academics, unions, writers, artists have all responded with statements, protests, sit-ins, workshops and in some cases direct actions at Australian ports of entry targeting Israeli shipping lines who play some role in Israel's crimes in Gaza. Mums, teachers, lawyers, healthcare workers for Palestine are just some of the many groups that have sprung up in the last several months where people are organising in their local communities and professions. I was recently invited to the small city of Newcastle on the country of the Awaba peoples who are the traditional owners of that land and who never ceded sovereignty. The local community are hosting Conversations for Palestine, a series of public forums to educate communities and organise in strategic ways to end Australian complicity with Israeli crimes in all its forms. They are horrified, for example, that in their community, the Australian arms manufacturer Vali Group is doing business with an Israeli arms company in several contracts selling Israeli military technology to the Australian military. I was on a panel with a local Aboriginal elder who helped set up Palestinian Action Group in Palestine in uh, Newcastle years ago, Auntie Tracy Henshaw. It has been heartening to see the Black Palestinian Solidarity Movement among Palestinian communities and First Nations people on the Australian continent continue to grow as a testament to shared global struggles against settler colonialism. The statements from the Victorian and New South Wales Aboriginal Legal Services calling for a ceasefire and an end to Israel's colonial violence, uh, occupation and apartheid are just some examples of that solidarity in action. While it's true that Australia supports a ceasefire, it took almost three months for Australia to support that call by voting in favour of the December General Assembly resolution. It has hardly condemned Israel's actions. Australia sees itself as a middle power, committed to international law. Yet successive Australian governments, whether conservative or progressive, have allied with Israel and provided it with political cover um, and engaged enthusiastically in developing significant economic and military ties, despite Israel's countless violations of international law. This impunity from UN member states like Australia must end. Australia's Foreign Minister has in the last several months sought to paint Australia's role as limited in its ability to influence. In light of Australia's significant military, political and trade links, this is a subversion of reality when Australia should be doing more by imposing the countermeasures it has available to it when states are in the commission of internationally wrongful acts. Given the reveal that Australia had approved 322 arms export permits to Israel since 2017 without any information about what was exported, our legal centre representing three Palestinian human rights organisations, Al-Haq Palestinian Centre for Human Rights and Al-Mizan Centre for Human Rights, 
filed in the federal court against the Minister for Defence in an attempt to gain more transparency over the process. We had to discontinue that application for reasons that I cannot discuss, but are still related to the problem of transparency. However, we are determined to continue to find avenues to uncover information and challenge those export decisions as we are concerned about exports via third countries. We therefore remain concerned the Minister for Defence is failing to act on Australia's legal obligations. We do think that that proceeding we filed, though brief, did have an impact on the Australian Government and any concerns it may have had about its complicity because, according to media reports, the Government has been stalling arms export permits to Israel. The Australian Government initially ignored the ICJ order and instead immediately suspended funding to UNRWA. Australia only reversed that disgraceful decision two weeks ago. Prior to the ICJ's order, the Foreign Minister stated that Australia does not accept the premise of the South African application. The finding of a plausible case of genocide by the ICJ forced Australia to change its response to the South African application. It finally acknowledged the ICJ order almost a week later, and there was a more substantial statement calling on Israel to comply with the court's decision in mid-February. In its initial statement, Australia stated that the ICJ's decision is binding on the parties. That, however, does not discharge Australia of its own legal obligations. The prohibition of genocide is a use cohesions norm, and all states have a duty to bring to an end any violation of those norms through lawful means. Our legal centre and Australian civil society have called on Australia to hold an inquiry and review and assess its political, military and economic relationships with Israel and move to impose diplomatic sanctions and travel bans against Israeli officials. At minimum, Australia should impose an arms embargo, a call now supported by several UN special rapporteurs. A comprehensive response must consider a two-way arms embargo and Australia should rescind existing contracts with Israeli arms manufacturers. Furthermore, Australia should, advise, uh, should issue an advisory to dual nationals warning them of criminal liability when serving or volunteering abroad in the Israeli military. Australia should monitor those individuals who are abroad, investigate them on return and refer them to prosecution where appropriate. Thank you very much.